<laughs> Thanks for the opportunity to be here. It is, it is a blessing, and I, I'm appreciative of it. Let's open in a word of prayer. Lord, thank You for Your Word. We thank You that it's true. We thank You that it's without error, that You preserved it for us, that we can know what You would have us to do. It's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. The theme this week is eternal glory. Richard is going to cover that in great detail. He'll explain to you the things that await. Uh, what I thought I would do is I'm going to spend my time this weekend talking about how to get through the nasty now and now. How do you get through this life? This life has tons of problems. And I want to give you some thoughts that, that I hope will be helpful to you. They've been helpful to me as to how to navigate this life. What I want to talk about this morning is what I'm going to call past tense blessings. And what I mean by that is it's blessings that you already have. I want to remind us of some of the things that are already true about us. So I have three points today that I want to make. The first is, while the full experience of some blessings is yet future, you have already been blessed. Second, uh, we're going to talk through a number of past tense blessings that you already have. And then third, We'll look at the fact that the blessings that you have are unchangeable. So that's our goal for today. Let's start with the first point. While the full experience of some blessings is yet future, you have already been blessed. Get with me 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. We'll look at verse 15. Now while you get that, I'm going to read to you how 2 Corinthians 2.15 is in the New King James. See if you notice a difference. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. You see the problem with the New King James? When it says unto those who are being saved, it makes salvation a process. It makes it something that's not yet complete. The correct reading, of course, is what the King James Bible has when it says in 2 Corinthians 2.15, in them that are saved. Now, I call this to your attention just to make this point. Does verb tense matter when you read the Scriptures? Amen. It absolutely does. Amen. When the New King James says you are being saved, it is wrong. That is not the way salvation works. Amen. I make that point because as we look at these past tense blessings, I want you to pay really careful attention to what it says in terms of the verb tense. What it's going to show you is these are things not that you're waiting for, not that you're hoping to get, but that you already have. So look with me, if you would, at Ephesians 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Ephesians 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now notice this. Who hath blessed us. Already occurred. Then notice what it says. All spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. What that verse is telling you is that you have already been blessed with all spiritual blessings. You're not waiting for some of them. Now listen, this life has problems. And, and, and let me put it this way. You live on an earth that's cursed by sin. Everyone you interact with is a sinner. And you walk around all day in a sinful body. So are you going to have difficulties in this life? Yes, you are. In fact, the greatest difficulty you have, you shave in the morning. Right? I mean, you're your own greatest enemy. So, while we have all these spiritual blessings, I'm not saying that life won't have problems. Life will have problems because we're on a sin-cursed earth. But does that change the fact that we already possess, we already own, we already have these blessings? No, it doesn't. We have them. Okay? Now, look with me, if you would, at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. There is, future, there is 
future glory that awaits that Richard's going to talk about. And we're going to experience some of these blessings in a more complete nature in the future. So I'm not saying there's not more to come. There is more to come. But my purpose today is to remind you of what you already have. So that's what we're going to do. So let's turn our attention this moment and uh, get 2 Timothy chapter 1. We're going to cover a bunch of blessings here that you already have this day right where you are. And I say that, of course, if you're saved. If you're not saved, you need to get saved. And that's simple because the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. He offers you eternal life as a free gift. If you have faith in the blood that he shed for you, that instant you're saved. It's not a process. So look with me at 2 Timothy 1 verse 9. Notice what it says. Who hath saved us. Has he already done it? Is it already complete? Has he already made the payment? Do you already own it? Yes, that's exactly what it's saying. Get with me 1 Corinthians 1.18. 1 Corinthians 1.18 is another one that the new King James has wrong. 1 Corinthians 1.18 For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved. The New King James there will say unto us which are being saved. Well notice what, what verse 18 says. When it says unto us which are saved, let me just make this point. That means once you have believed the gospel, you are from that moment forward saved. You already are. That ought to give you some clarity about eternal security. If you can lose it, if you can forfeit it by something that you do, then you're not really saved at the moment, are you? You're still in jeopardy. You're still at risk of losing it. But what the verse says is that you are saved. You can know for a fact that you've been delivered from punishment. You can know for a fact that you're going to heaven. You can know for a fact that you can't lose it. Look at Romans 11. Romans chapter 11, verse 30. Romans chapter 11, verse 30. For as ye in times past have not believed God, yet have now, notice again, past tense, obtained mercy through their unbelief. Have you already obtained mercy on the basis of what Christ did? The answer to that is yes. Get Colossians 2. So I'm not going to number these out, but we have about uh, 18 or 19 of these past tense blessings, and we're just going to go through them. And it may feel like I'm giving you a list, and, and I guess I am. What I want you to just do is I, I want, what I find to be the case is this. I find that sometimes in the commotion of life, we can lose track of what's real. Because what happens is we get busy, right? And there's, there's problems, there's things to focus on. And sometimes it's helpful to just be reminded of what you have in Christ and who you now are. Amen. So Colossians 2.13 and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, notice, having forgiven. Past tense. It's already happened. You all trespasses. So let me ask you a question. Is there ever a time where you reflect back on life and there are things that you regret? And the answer, of course, is yes. And are there ever things where you think and you feel guilt about because you realize I didn't handle this the right way and I should have done something else and I'm just not proud of the way that I did something. The, the, the truth, of course, is that it, you know we all have those things, right? The things that we would avoid if we could. The things that we could change if we could do them over. What I want you to know, if, if, if Colossians 2.13 is true, which it is, you have already been forgiven for how many trespasses? All of them. All of them. So do you need to continue to feel guilt about it? You've already been forgiven for it. For all of them. See, it, 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 let's be honest. Isn't it easy to beat yourself up over things that you've done? And, and the answer is that it is. Uh, let me put the question this way. Do, uh, do athletes remember more keenly their greatest wins or their greatest losses? They do, don't they? 
They remember the greatest losses. It's more painful. There's more regret. There's more the sense of what I could have done. Well, that's the nature of what life is. We have a keen memory of many of our failings. And if you allow your mind to dwell on those things, it can just consume you and ruin you. Because you'll dwell on, on all your failings, which you're a sinner and you have many of them. But Colossians 2.13 is emphatically true. You right now have already been forgiven for everything bad you ever did. And so you don't have to live with the guilt and the regret. It, it's forgiven. God who knows you perfectly, who knows all those things, has forgiven you of all of them. That's just awesome. Get 1 Corinthians 6. First Corinthians 6. Start in verse 9. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And so it gives you that whole list of the folks that are those things are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Now read the first couple words of verse 11. And such were some of you. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. Notice what it then says. But ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So it says you're washed, it says you're sanctified, it says you're justified. To be washed is to cleanse in water purified. We've all had that experience. You're out working in the yard or doing something and you're just caked in mud and gunk. And what's the first thing you want to do? You just want to get washed and you want to get rid of it. Well, the same is true spiritually, right? You want to just deal with the, the muck of the past. And what that says is, is it says ye are washed. Has it already taken place? Yeah. Yes, it has. Then notice what it says. Ye are sanctified. The idea of sanctified is to be made holy, to set, be set apart for sacred services, to set apart for God's use. So what God has done with you is the first thing He's done is He's washed you. The guilt that you had, that muck, that filth, has been washed away. Then what He's done with you is He has set you apart. He has taken you and placed you so that you are now for His service, for His purposes. He's made you holy. And then notice what it says, the, the third thing. Ye are justified. To justify is to pardon and to clear from guilt and to accept as righteous. So we talked a little bit about forgiveness just a minute ago, where God's forgiven all of your sins. That's true. You know what he additionally has done? He has declared you righteous. He's already done that. He's taken the righteousness of Christ, Jesus Christ, who had perfect righteousness, and he has already put that to your account. So that when God looks at you, He views you as righteous because He's already justified you. Now let's go back to the first part of verse 11. And honestly, just memorize this. And such were some of you. I find that so incredibly powerful. It goes through the list in verse 9 and 10, and it talks about fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, effeminate, thieves, covetous. It goes through the whole thing. And then notice what it says in verse 11. And such were some of you. So if you have committed murder, you are a murderer. But what 1 Corinthians 6 says, based upon the authority of God's word, is that when you're saved, that is no longer who you are. Amen. And such were some of you, but it's no longer who you are. Isn't that something? Because what happens is, you know, man looks at man, and man looks at man as um, he's done this. This is what he is. He's a drunkard. He's a ne'er-do-well. He's a drug user. He's this, he's that. And what 1 Corinthians 6 says, the moment you have faith, that is no longer who you are. It's what you were. Isn't that something? Your fundamental identity has changed in Christ. You're not what you were. Look at Colossians 1, if you would. Colossians chapter 1. <coughs> and 
And again, so keep me honest on this, but keep looking at these verses and notice how they're all past tense. Okay, these are not things we're waiting for. These are not things we're hoping to get. Colossians 1.13 Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness. Are you already this moment delivered from the power of darkness? Amen. The answer is yes, you are. Then notice what it says. And hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. So what you're no longer part of is the kingdom of darkness and you have been translated into the kingdom of his dear son. Notice verse 14. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. When you look at redemption in the Old Testament, it's often used in the context of someone in Israel will get into debt. And in order to, um, what they'll then be forced to do financially is they'll have to mortgage, they'll have to part with a piece of property and that they would like then to redeem in the future. But what they need to do is they need to redeem themselves. They need to be purchased out of this slavery of debt that they're in. Now, when you take that metaphor and you think about it for your life, here's the problem you have. You are under the debt, you were at one point, of your sins. Your sins created this massive debt toward God, right? And if you think about that honestly for a moment, do you think that you sinned once a day? Or did you sin more than that, right? So if, you just, if, if that makes you 10 years old, let's say. So once a day times 365 times 10, you had these uh, 30, uh, 3,000 sins, right? And of course the reality is, do you sin more than once a day? Of course you do. And many of us are older than 10. So you know what that means? You have these tens of thousands of sin debts that you owe God that, that's just overwhelming, right? It's not an issue of owing millions of dollars. It's... You have to satisfy the righteousness of God and you've heaped up all these sins. Well, what verse 14 says is you already have been bought out of the debt that you were under. Amen. I mean, that would have been crushing, right? I don't understand how people can think they can work their way to heaven. Amen. People have the idea, well, if my good outweighs my bad, then I'll be okay. Okay, let's, first of all, that's not true. But let's say that's true. Are you insane enough to think your good outweighs your bad? Are you aware of your bad? <laughs> your bad is constant and you keep heaping it up. Amen. Right? Amen. Well, what verse 14 says there is that you have redemption through His blood. You've been forgiven of all sins. Get Galatians 2. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. So you've already been crucified with Christ. What does that mean? Look at Romans 6. Romans chapter 6, verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. So you've been crucified with Christ. Romans 6 makes clear that what that means is that your old man has been crucified. And this is probably not the right definition, but this is the way I think of it. What the old man is, is it's everything about yourself that you hate. Right? Are there things that you see in yourself that you hate? And the answer, of course, is yes. Paul says in, in Romans 7.15, but what I hate, that do I. Have you ever found that experience in life where you just end up doing things that you hate? What Romans 6 says, though, is that our old man has already been crucified. Galatians 5.24 says that uh, God has crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts thereof. Look with me at Ephesians 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. So there's a couple things going on here. The first thing is that your old man was crucified. He was put to death. But then you have been quickened. You have been given life. So 
I, I'll use this as an example. I hope this doesn't offend anyone. There is a modern fascination with zombies, and I can't understand this and I can't stand it, right? I mean, they're just absolutely disgusting, right? And they have all these zombie movies, and they have people that are sort of, you know, they're, they're dead, but they're walking around, and it, it's just disgusting. The verse that it reminds me of, Proverbs 8, 36, all they that hate me do what? Love death. And so there's this modern fascination with death. Can I suggest to you that what happens is what's actually going on on the earth is grosser than any of those movies? Because it's not people that are physically dead walking around, but what the earth is full of is it's full of people that are breathing, that are physically living, that are spiritually dead. Right? So they wander through the motions of life, and there's great commotion, and there's great activity, and there's commerce, but what are they? They're spiritually dead, and if they don't solve that problem, this is actually the best part of their eternity, right? Amen. Unfortunately, that's the case. Well, the beauty of what God has done for us, every part about us that was hateful and disgusting, the old man has been crucified, and we have been quickened. We've been given life that we didn't have before. By the way, what is the Bible definition of eternal life? If you study that out, what John 17, 3 says, Now this is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Well, the reason I mention that point is, people sometimes think, well, eternal life is something in the future. No. Eternal life is knowing Jesus Christ and the true God. If you are saved, your eternal life has already begun. Right? You already have it. Get with me Galatians 3. Galatians chapter 3. Galatians 3.27 For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So that's a past tense baptism. Look at Romans 6. Romans chapter 6. Verse 3. Romans 6, 3. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized, again, past tense, into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death. So what that means is, and that's obviously not water baptism there, what that means is that when you were baptized into Christ, what you were specifically baptized into was His, his death. So read verse 4. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. What, what that means then is, we, verse 3, we were baptized into death, and that we were buried with him in verse 4. That's already occurred. So let me suggest this to you. One of the reasons you can clearly know that you're going to get a new body, that you're going to be resurrected from the dead, that you're going to get a spiritual body at some point in time, is that what happened to you is you were baptized into Christ's death, and you were buried with Him, and how much hold over Jesus Christ did death have? I mean, He conquered it, right? Look with me at Hebrews 2. At least the way I understand it, Romans 6 is one of the clearest indications that you're going to get a new body because what happens is you've been identified with Christ in His death. Now notice Hebrews 2.14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, He also Himself likewise took part of the same, that through death He might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. In other words, Jesus Christ is superior to death itself. He destroyed him that had the power of death. And when you were buried with him, guess what? You're going to be resurrected like him. It's certain. And, and Romans 6 says that you are already buried with him. Get Romans 5. Romans 5. 
Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, verse 10. For if when we were enemies, we used to be enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son. You've already been reconciled according to that verse. You know, one of the things that happens in life, and I'm sure you've seen this, is you have relationships that are estranged, right? Other people that for some reason they won't talk to you or you won't talk to them. Sometimes these things last for a long, long, long time. Well, guess what? You've already been reconciled to God. You were an enemy, but what Christ did was sufficient that God views you as already reconciled to Him. Look at verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's a verse I reflect on a lot. Here's why. Do, people, do you ever hear people say, I don't feel saved? And they say those things because what they're telling you is that they're evaluating their spiritual life. They're evaluating their relationship with God by what they feel. Right? So for whatever reason, they, 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 they don't feel right about things at that time. The beautiful thing in verse 5 is it tells you, number 1, you've, or chapter 5, verse 1, You've already been reconciled to God, and notice what it says. We have peace with God. So do you right now, this moment, have peace with God? Yeah. The answer is yes. Can you lose it? No. Well, I don't feel like it. It doesn't matter what you feel like. You already have peace with God based upon the authority of that verse. Isn't that something? I mean, you used to be an enemy, but now God has already made you at peace with Him. Look at Ephesians 1. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6. Ephesians 1, 6. To the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us, notice, accepted in the Beloved. Are you already made accepted in Him? Yeah. Yes. Have you ever dealt with things in life where people don't accept you? They resent you? For whatever reason, they, you know, they, they don't want you to be part of what they're doing. Well, of course we have. We've all dealt with things like that. Ephesians 1.6 tells you you are already accepted in the Beloved. Think about that just for a minute. Does God have perfect, total love and acceptance for His Son? Yes, He does. Is there a time where He wants Him to not be there? He wants Him to go away? Or is it a perfect, loving relationship? It is. It's one of total acceptance. And what Ephesians 1 6 is that it says you are already accepted in the beloved. That's just that's just great. Ephesians 1 14. Which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. Have you already been purchased by God? Yes, you have. Get Romans 8. So now let's talk about predestination. Predestination is not what many theologians think it is. Romans 8.29 For whom He did foreknow, He also did predestinate. And that, in, that includes uh, you as a member of the body of Christ. Notice what it says there. He did predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom He did predestinate, them He also called. And whom He called, them He also justified. And whom He justified, them He also glorified. So what that's saying is, number one, you've already been called, you've already been justified, you've already been glorified, and God has predestinated you. So let's make sure we understand what that is. Uh, look at verse 23. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoptions. Now here's an example of something we are waiting for. Waiting for the adoption to wit... The redemption of our body. So what is the adoption on the basis of that verse? The redemption of the body, right? When, what event is that? Rapture. It's catching up the body of Christ, right? So we're waiting for the catching up. Now notice with me Ephesians 1. Ephesians chapter 1. 
Ephesians 1, verse 5. Having predestinated us. That's already occurred. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself. So let's make sure we understand what those verses just told us. Romans 8 said we were predestinated to be conformed to the image of His Son. Romans 8 also told us the, the adoption is the redemption of the body. When we turn to Ephesians 1, it says we're predestinated unto the adoption. Ephesians 1.5. So here's what this means. Does God predestinate all the events of your life? No. Does He predestinate that you go to McDonald's? No. Does He predestinate that the guy cuts you off in traffic? And you know He doesn't predestinate any of those things. There's no verse that says He does. But there is a verse that says He predestinated you unto the adoption. So what does that mean? Here's what that means. What God did is before time began, He decided that every member of the body of Christ was going to go through the adoption and, and go through the redemption of the body and receive the spiritual body that God wanted us to have for all eternity. Amen. What that means is this. Has God predestinated your future? And the answer is yes. Whether you like it or not, you are going to be caught up, you're going to get a new body, and you're going to be in heaven forever. Amen. Right? He has predestinated the body of Christ to doing that. He hasn't predestinated everything that's going to happen the rest of this day or the rest of your life, but has He predestinated what He's going to do with you in giving you a new body? Yes, He has. Look at me at Ephesians 3. Ephesians chapter 3. Look at verse 11. And I should read 9, 10, and 11, but I'm just going to read 11 so you see this. According to the eternal purpose which He purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. What God did in time past is He had an eternal purpose with the body of Christ and you get into the body of Christ by faith where He has a purpose that He is accomplishing with, with you for all eternity. You're in Ephesians, get Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 9. Now let me just say this before we go on. One of the things I rejoice in more every day is that I'm predestined under the adoption. And you know why? These bodies keep falling apart. Amen. Right? I mean, I'm sure that's your experience. That's my experience. I find there are times where I wake up and I hurt. And I didn't do anything but sleep. <laughs> right? And how can this be? Well, it's because this body is a mess. And hallelujah, God has predestinated the body of Christ to get new spiritual bodies in His perfect timing. Amen. So that's pretty exciting. Ephesians 1 verse 9. Another thing God has done for you is He has informed you. Having made known unto us the mystery of His will. You know God's desire today? He wants members of the body of Christ to know His will. And He's made it known unto us. If we are ignorant of it, it is not His fault. It is our fault because He's made it known unto us. Look at verse 11. In whom also, notice, we have obtained an inheritance. Do you already have an inheritance according to that verse? Yes, you do. 2 Thessalonians 2. 2 Thessalonians 2, 16. 2 Thessalonians 2, 16. Now our Lord Jesus Christ Himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us. God already loves us. Get Colossians 2. I'm flying here. There's just a couple more things I have to get through. Colossians chapter 2, verse 10. This is a verse... Uh, that when I was single was very helpful to me and, it, and it's still helpful to me. Colossians 2 verse 10 And ye are complete in Him. One of the things that's common today is the concept of the soulmate. Right? There's someone out there and if you just bump into the right person that person will complete you. Right? They're like this jigsaw piece and if you find them you'll be complete. And what I would just say to that is that's total baloney. Right? 
If that's true, if there is a soulmate for you, what happens if she marries the wrong person? <laughs> then she's married to the wrong person, her husband's married to the wrong person, his wife is married, no one on the earth is married to the right person if the concept of the soulmate is true, right? Because one person can mess the whole thing up. It doesn't work that way. And if you are made complete by another person, that means your entire life before that you were incomplete, and your entire life after that you're incomplete. That's not the way that it works. Colossians 2.10 says you are already, ye are, complete in Him. Amen. Isn't that something? Amen. So when you feel inadequate, when you feel imperfect, when you feel all of those things which are real, guess what? Are you nonetheless already complete? Yes, yes you are. And by the way, that is helpful because then you can love people without needing something back from them. That's right. right? When you love folks and they need to perform to a standard for you to be happy with them, you're just putting them under a law performance system that they're going to fail, just as you would. Amen. Right? And if you instead approach it from the fact, I'm already complete. I'm not loving you to get something from you. I'm already complete. I'm just loving you on the basis of what Christ has done for me. Now I don't need something back. So you're already complete. Get Romans 8. Romans 8, verse 37. Romans 8, 37. Nay, in all these things we are already more than conquerors. So I'm going to read you this list real quick and then we're going to move on. You, here are the past tense blessings we've looked at. So just put this in your mind, if you will. You are already saved, forgiven, washed, sanctified, justified, freed from the dominion of sin, your old man has been crucified, you have been quickened, you've been baptized, reconciled, accepted, purchased, predestinated, purposed, informed, have obtained an inheritance, been loved, made complete, and made victorious. Amen. None of those things are things that you are waiting to have happen. You already have all of them on the authority of the Word of God. So now read those again when you have free time, but I, I, you know, they're all past tense. You already have them. Point three. The blessings that God has given you are unchangeable. They're past tense. They've already happened. There are things that are already true about you that will not change. Get with me Romans 11. Romans 11, verse 29. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. Does God give you a blessing and then you sin and He's shocked and surprised and He takes it back? Well, of course not. The gifts and calling of God are without repentance. Look with me at Ephesians 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. There's one more past tense thing I want to mention before we conclude, and that is that you're sealed. Ephesians 4.30 And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. So you're already sealed. Get Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1.13 In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed, past tense, with that Holy Spirit of promise. So two things about being sealed. The first thing a seal does, you think you see this in the movies all the time, the king will issue a proclamation, they'll put some wax at the bottom of it that's hot, and they take the king's seal and they stamp it, right? So then they'll go post that in the kingdom, and when you disobey that proclamation, you're not just disobeying a piece of paper on a tree, you're disobeying the authority of the person that issued the proclamation. So in other words, the seal is a mark of ownership. We talked earlier about how you're purchased. Well, you are now not your own. You belong to God. The next sense of the word sealing, you've all done this. You bring the, the jar of pickles home from the store and you crank it a fourth of a turn, right? What happens? It pops because you've broken that seal. Well, notice verse 13. What are you sealed by? With that Holy Spirit of promise. So how many things in the universe can overpower the Holy Spirit? Well, Satan can't, and guess what? You can't either. 
So those blessings, your ownership by God, what He's going to accomplish in you can't be changed because nothing can overpower the Holy Spirit that's sealing you. Look at verse 14. Which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. So we all know what earnest money is or a down payment. You're buying something big. Let's say it's a car. And you want the person, you want the seller to hold it for you. So you put down some money and you're going to come back with the rest of it. You put down your earnest money. What happens if you don't come back with the rest of the money? They keep your earnest money. Yeah, you can lose it, right? So now think about what that verse actually just said. You were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is given you as an earnest, a guarantee of what God's going to do in the future. So here's my question. How many transactions does God start and then run out of money and forfeit the Holy Spirit because He can't complete it? Well, it's just insanity to even ask the question, right? So what God has purpose to accomplish with you, He will accomplish with you because He's not going to forfeit the Holy Spirit. Amen. It's just absolutely ridiculous to even conceive. So let me wrap up. The reason I want to focus on the past tense blessings is this. As you go through the commotion, the hustle bustle of life, the, the financial pressures, the health pains, the interpersonal problems, it's very easy to look at the things of this world and just be overwhelmed and frustrated and vexed. And I get it. I, I'm the exact same way. What I want to remind you of is this. The moment you have faith in Christ, God, past tense, blessed you with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Yes, there's a future enjoyment to some of these things where it's going to be even fuller than it is today. But do you right now already have them? The answer is yes. So sometimes when we're feeling sorry for ourselves, we need to reflect on what God's already done for us. And we need that, that to be our guide.